<laughs> How about Pat? She's the book person. Hi, <laughs> Pat. Hmm. We're just passing the buck. Hi. Um, Hi. I, hello. Um, gee, <laughs> I, I guess what, what I would say is sort of independent, you know, um, mind your own business, uh, help people if they ask you. <laughs> Um, that's, that's my few words. That's, that's pretty good. I, I, independent was one of the words I, I, I couldn't <laughs> get off the tip of my tongue when I was talking to her about it, but when we do, I'll, I'll make sure I let her know. I think we have very strong opinions too. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, and the good thing is I, I met with a gentleman who had, um, he had sent me an email and he's like, before we started, he's like, things have got to change. And and uh, so when we we uh, we caught up, well informed. It's not just like oh I, I saw this here and I'm going to parrot the same thing. It's like I saw this here, I read this, read that, talked to this person, looked at my life experiences, and here's where I'm at. Now tell me what you think. And it's like mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's awesome. <coughs> So is Orca recording this, or are you using Orca as a way as a means to do Zoom? I think that they're recording this. If I'm that's my impression right. too. Yeah, I think that they're recording. Okay, and then it'll be broadcast. Uh oh, I should have done my hair. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> well it is uh 605 and um one again uh thank you all for the opportunity as people uh sign in hopefully more and then again it's a holiday weekend so we'll see what happens but uh i'm brian pete i'm new here in montpelier and uh the the new chief taking over for tony fakus and uh, i've had the had the honor to speak with some folks here earlier this morning and uh, some folks I, I, I haven't, but um, um, first and foremost, thank you all very much. And, and the whole idea behind this is to to talk to people in the community and find out what it is that the Montpelier Police Department is doing right and what we what we have our challenges for. And um, and then also to um, if 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 need be um, or if you know if you so desire to go into the national dialogue about um, policing and what's going on within the profession and within the institution and where I stand, or what, what I believe about it, um, what I look to do with our department going forward. And um, so it's just to have a very uh, good, robust dialogue and conversation. And then for me to walk away with ideas um, on how we can um, work on and update our strategic plan um, what we can prioritize and what we want to get done and when we want to get it done and then get that information out to everyone so we can make sure that we hold ourselves accountable to the people we're sworn to serve. So um, with that, I, I, I'd uh, welcome any comments or questions, concerns about uh, policing and, and uh, look forward to a, to a very good dialogue, a robust dialogue. So should we just jump in? Sure. <laughs> Before we start asking questions, when I first tried to join the meeting, it asked me for a password, and which it which I didn't have. And then I tried a different link on the Facebook page that let me in without the password. But I'm just wondering if other people maybe are having trouble getting in. And uh, so I just wanted to mention that. I don't know if there is anybody out there who could help folks who are struggling with that. Yeah, I had the same thing, Joan. I, I had copied it on my Facebook and it didn't work, but then I went to the police department and it worked, so yeah. Yeah, so I just wanted to say that because I that it's possible that there's a few other folks trying to get in who are running into that, so. Okay, thank you. And, and this, this at noon, we had the same issue because I used the link that was on Front Porch Forum. Right. And when I called the police department, they said that that wasn't their official site. <laughs> However, I although I recognize that in the past, police department has used Front Porch Forum to advertise their 
conversation with a cop. So I thought it was legit. And I guess I would just like to make sure that in the future that they're synced. I mean, both the same information is given on both that you do continue front porch forum. A lot of people use read it. So, but I wouldn't go on to the Montpelier Police Department necessarily. Okay. That was my experience too with front porch forum. In fact, I only got on because Rachel called the office and forwarded the link to me. So there was a little networking there, but I think you're right. People are probably at sea trying to get on. I will definitely make sure we look into that and figure out, because normally if we put the link to it and that link has the password in it, folks should be able to just click on it and open it up. So I'll def definitely look at Front Porch Forum and, and, um, and, and, uh, and, and see how we can uh, make sure that it works and, and we'll test it out. And that's also true, Chief, for the um, Montpelier Police Department Facebook page. Um, okay, thank you. I guess this is just a sign of our times that we're all <laughs> having trouble getting into Zoom meetings. It's not just, it's everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I would make sure we get that looked at, hopefully fixed by, by the next time we uh, do another round table. So I, I, I can start because since I cheated a little bit by sitting in on the uh, town meeting at noon, I've been thinking about the questions and answers that came up at that town meeting. And um, so I have a national question that I would like to bring in, focus into uh, Montpelier specifically. And I'm wondering that given the um, general under-resourcing of social and mental health services, um, I'm wondering if you've given any thought to, and I know you're, you're like, this is your third day into to, <laughs> uh, to, uh, being in Montpelier in this official capacity, but what strategies do you envision uh, to strengthen these much needed services. I mean, I really did not like the word defund uh, police, but I definitely am supportive of more resources in the community. And I'm not sure where that would come, uh, where that money would come from. But anyway, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um... Uh, just speaking for myself and what I've learned so far, you know what, I like like defund, I, I hear what you're saying. I think that maybe if folks are saying, well, not necessarily defund, but take some of that money and put it elsewhere, reallocate might be a good idea, uh, a good word to use. Um, and, and by right, because people need to know what our budget is and where we're putting our money at. So we do plan on um, putting that out there and showing uh, our fiscal budget, showing what, we're, what we've been purchasing and, and where a majority of it comes from. With, with regards to uh, folks who are in the, um, the, um, the counseling business, social workers, um, from, from what I understand that uh, the Washington Mental Health um, uh, group is, is very good at what they do and they have a lot of um, social workers, but they're also like everyone else, uh, are, they're stretched thin. So in, in looking at that, I think, um, I have to, to talk to them a little bit more, learn a little bit more. I think it's Mary Moulton who, is, uh, who, who runs the, um, we, 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 we spoke briefly, but um, we're looking to, to talk more. But with the direction in regarding to policing, um, of course we are, it's, it has been budgeted to have a social worker um, embedded within the department. Also, you know, to, to bounce back from Barry to uh, Montpelier because a lot of the things that we're seeing is it's folks that are coming one way or the other. So, um, so it, it's going to be, uh, I think, very, very well useful there. And having uh, he or she in, in place would, um, would allow us uh, to make sure that people aren't slipping through the cracks, that if, if we do come into contact with somebody who is in crisis or we come, to somebody, come into contact with, say, someone who's homeless on the street and they may not have the resources or the, the means to go pick up their medication, just for an example. So how can we connect with a social worker to look at a volunteer structure or to look at even officers trying to figure out where we can go out and how we can, can help them with this particular scene, depending on call volumes. 
but um, how we can all um, contribute our time and what our resources are to help people because that's what it ultimately it's about. With um, so everyone's dealing with the of course limited budgets, especially with COVID nineteen and and now seeing the news and and how we're not uh, uh, the the curve is going up and not flattening or going down. Um, I'm hoping that uh, that Vermont stays strong. And, and we keep doing what we're all encouraging each other doing and looking out for each other and wearing masks and that hopefully our local economy isn't hurt that much. But one of the, uh, the, the department is, has a, is, is under team two. So that was a concept. It's kind of a hybrid concept with um, CIT training, um, uh, required mental health training in the state and, and officers involvement. So bringing a level of um, a training to officers, it's not quite full as, as full as CIT, and CIT stands for Crisis Intervention Team. And that comes back to the 80s, um, and there was, it's primarily based off the Memphis model. So in the 80s, uh, uh, there was an incident that somebody who was in a mental health crisis was shot by the police department who didn't, who, you know, as the officers came, uh, basically they couldn't recognize what was going on here. Uh, so then, then it became a push to train officers in what mental health crisis looks like and how do we de-escalate it and how do we do it without us being hurt and without the people that were called to help being hurt as well. So that's where a crisis intervention team or CIT was born and it's been worked on through the time. So as of right now, um, I have in one of these bags, uh, these USB ports, I have a, when I was in Alamogordo, we worked with the Bureau of Justice Assistance, the BJA, um, PRA Associates, which is a uh, 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 woman-owned business here in New York. And, uh, and we developed a, pretty much a national standard on how to implement a CIT program. Only in the major cities like a New York or, or a Las Vegas um, or LA, do they have like a dedicated CIT team that can develop the curriculum and teach it. You don't see them, you don't see CIT being offered in smaller agencies or with smaller populations such as ours and or even um, Burlington. I don't even think that Burlington has a CIT program. But what we're going to do here in Montpelier is we're going to take that plan and we're going to implement it here and we're going to train our officers as well as keep the team to concept. But I have to talk to Mary and see to, just to make sure this is going to be the right fit. But my vision is to um, have CIT training here. Um, train our officers in CIT training. Um, hope, and there's, there's something else too about that. There's a research, because there are some officers are gonna be better, um, more innate in, in how they're going to, in, in how they're gonna absorb the training and how they're gonna absorb the information. Other officers may not be very good at it. So we wanna make sure we, the state does have mandatory training so officers can realize um, mental health crisis when they see it but we kind of want those who are going to be really talented and having a knack for it. So we'll train uh, those officers. Not only will we do that, but we'll open that training up to Barrie, to Berlin, to Hartford, to Burlington, to every possible place that we can free, come on in. And we're going to conduct these CIT trainings so that we can train as many people in Vermont, um, especially in our local areas, as we possibly can. The other uh, avenue to that, that would go into the funding thing is if we say if we charged, I don't know, or asked for twenty dollars per officer who came, you know, understanding what where their budgets come from, we can take that money and supplement our training budget without having to come back to the city and to the taxpayers and saying, well, we need more training, so we need more money, and um, and and that's just how it's got to be. So we need to be creative, and uh, and how we come up with our solutions to, to finding new resources and new opportunities. And I'm sorry about that rambling answer, but I hope that. Yeah, that gives you some. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, doctor. I can't hear you. And can you? <laughs> There's one social worker between to be used by Montpelier and Barry. Did I understand that? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, doctor. That that's that's um, what's in the budget. So I think it's a one third a share between uh, Barry. Uh, Montpelier and uh, Washington County. That seems very inadequate. I'm a lay person, uh, but. Yeah, just one person. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, I, for. Yeah, I, I think um, I think uh, it it 
it, you know, there is again, that opportunity to, um, to hopefully to, to grow the team. Uh, but I, at this point, um, it, it's not that this social worker from how I envision it will just be, you know, doing counseling services or uh, directly dealing with and, and, and having a clientele, if you will, of each person that we come across. I think it's going to be more or less assisting us in uh, minimizing the crisis and then pointing people into the right resources and then maintaining and tracking those folks to make sure that they're not slipping and falling through the cracks. Hmm. That's my assumption though. I have to, you know, we, we're in the, in the early planning stages. I think they just posted the position um, maybe a week and a half ago. Would you also be working with the Youth Services Bureau in Montpelier? Because they, I think they also have like folks on staff who are, you know, trained in dealing with mental health crisis and like deal with a lot of the youth who are in challenging situations? I would definitely say yes. Uh, I, there, there are going to be uh, times in this conversation that I'm, I'm, I will not know the answer because I'm still trying to learn. Yeah. Um, but from what I understand from Tony um, and, uh, and the rest of the officers here that we already uh, do have a very good working relationship. We just want to make sure that we continue that relationship. Um, again, let me, let me check to make sure, but I, I believe we do. And, but make sure that 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 relationship stays robust and that um, like, for example, if we have, um, if, if we're able to keep the SRO position, that any time that we come into contact with um, youth, whether if we're, whether if we're called to a, a domestic uh, incident and if while we're there, we notice that there's uh, one of the kiddos is there, that we can make that information known to the school, make that information known to, uh, to the youth services and um, and all just kind of keeping the loop that hey, if if this student comes in, you know let let's remember that there there's something going on on the home front. So it would take a communication between what law enforcement sees and making sure that we all as as one group, as one circle, as one team, uh, facilitate that flow of information and that we don't safeguard this information. In a lot of other places and jurisdictions and police departments, it's normally like trying to get access to police records or reports. So it's kind of like pulling teeth in certain cases. I don't think that should be the case here because the, the end goal is to, um, to keep people as safe as possible. Well, I understood you to say something about reallocation of funding and that that information is going to be available. Yes, what, 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 I, what we plan to do, and again, we've had, um, we've been in, in discussions with, um, with my bosses, with Cameron, with, uh, with Bill Frazier, and then we met with the mayor again just yesterday, I believe. And so we're talking about pushing the information out so, pu so it's public facing and people can see. And part of that information is going to be looking at the budget and looking at what um, having diagrams, maps, and everything that we possibly can in visual aids to show where a majority of the budgeting that we have. So I think, if I'm not mistaken, the, um, the department's budget is in the area of, I think, 3.5, 3.8, somewhere to that effect. Um, I would say probably 75 to 80 percent of that is going to be personnel-based costs, um, and everything else is going to be going towards like uh, current technology, equipment, maintaining that type of equipment. If I'm uh, if I'm correct, but so we would put that information out there. But when we do compare that to to other locales, budgets for uh, public um, public safety is is, is is higher than where we're spending. I think uh, I think here the Department of Public Works has a higher budget than the, uh, than the police department, uh, significantly higher. And when and where will that information be available to the public? We, we want to put that information out on our website and out on the city's website. And then we're also trying to see how we can, uh, you know, maybe um, other different creative ways and outlets that we can get that information out, whether through social media or even um, one of the thoughts I've been kind of having in the background, but trying to see if we can save money on it, but putting out hard copies and, 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 and allowing folks who are walking by the station, hey, here's, here's a pamphlet on, on what we found and, and everything else to that effect. And when will that be available? 
Uh, I'm hoping to have that information out within the next two months. The part of one of the one of the the time lags is going to be um, starting on Monday for the next two weeks. I'll be downstate at um, the police academy doing certification training and coming back here on the 19th. But it is a uh, we do have a very uh, uh, we're doing this with a very robust sense of urgency because we understand how important this is uh, to, to the people of our community. And uh, we wanna make sure that we're as, uh, as transparent as possible. Well, what about this, the budget? Maybe Cameron can answer that. When is the city council going to um, consider the budget for Montpelier? Hi. Um Brian, do you mind if I jump in? Oh, right. oh I'm sorry. You mean to? No, it's okay. Hi, everyone. For um, people who don't know, my name is Cameron Niedermeyer. I'm the assistant city manager. And um, just forgive me for my day off appearance. <laughs> um, uh, so the, the budget has been um, approved for fiscal year 21. We have had to make some amendments. Good. So thank you for that question. Yeah. Good to hear. I, I have a question um, for Brian, and I mean, I don't even know if it's a question exactly, but just something that I would like to, I just a thought I would like to share, and maybe you could just think about it and get back to people later. But um, my older, I, I have an older child who's 20 and who graduated at Montpelier High two years ago. and. At some point during that school year, I can't remember exactly when this was. There was a, there was a somebody on the grounds of the school who had like tried to hold up the bank across the street and ended up over at the high school, and ended up being shot on the campus. Um, and so my daughter was at school, and they had a whole lockdown, and this whole like SWAT teams and stuff came in. And I would say that. Um, she had, you know, she'd been really involved that whole year with like raising the Black Lives Matter flag and been educating herself on, on all kinds of things, including, you know, the way the, on a, sort of on a national level, like how police violence plays out. And so uh, she went into, you know, she came into that experience already being very hesitant about, about police and came out of it feeling really like, uh, that that confirmed all that hesitation. And um, and then there was another shooting near the roundabout of Montpelier in this past year, um, and which happens to be pretty close to where I live. Um, and so, you know, pretty much every day we walk by like the little memorial that's there on the bridge. Um, and so I just feel like, um, there's a lot of young people who I think have a lot of hesitation about the police, both on a national level and right here in Montpelier, even though they may not have personally had a bad experience with a police officer, but those two things I think affected a lot of youth. Um, you know, like everybody who was at the high school that day was affected by that. And um, so I, I would just love to like, I would love like the police here in Montpelier to start thinking about like how do they interact with some of these young people who've you know grown up in in a time when like there's a lot of questioning about what the police are doing and I think rightfully so and yet like there may be a time when one of these young people needs to call on the police and they might not feel safe doing that and um, I certainly know my daughter would like call the police only I mean, she said I would just never call the police, and I, that that is hard for me to hear because, like, I I don't call the police very often, but I like to know that that's an option in some certain situations. And um, anyway, I just think it's something that I would love for you to consider, like how how to like start building a better relationship with some of the young people in our community, um, and what it might take to like. Um, make them feel more um, like the police are part of the community instead of um, 
just something that they see as, as hurtful. And, and I, and I understand like this may not be even be the full reality, but if that's somebody's perspective and all that they've really seen, it's very difficult for them to, to get past that. And I, and I think for some young people, that is all that they've really seen in their lifetime. This is very good, very good points. And, and I, I think that would, I'm immediately thinking about the SRO program because I, I think that if we, that now to me is now more than ever is a time for dialogue. Now more than ever is a time that we expose ourselves to each other and we expose ourselves to what we've come to perceive a given person, a given race, a given profession to be. And that we, we have to be brave and, 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 and expose ourselves to each other and listen to each other and understand where that, where that comes from. So that's one of the things that scares me most about pulling an SRO from the school because it's going to withdraw. It's gonna kind of play, it's gonna move into a narrative that police departments are evil and we're not. And, and, it, and it's, going to, it's going to justify, justify that. And, and I, I would say specifically here in Montpelier, what that, that the Montpelier Police Department has done an exceptional job um, with this SRO program, with its community relations to the best of its abilities. And um, I would just hate it to see it go the wayside of another agency or another department that may not have lived up to the expectations of the department. So I fear that and hope that we're not gonna be painted with that broad brush. So I think that uh, having police officers around to talk to people um, is going to show that we're human. And at the same time that we need to interact with the people that we serve so that we don't become indifferent. With the, um, with the incident, what's the instance that happened in, in, in at the uh, at, at the high school? Really unfortunate. And um, what what I understand that situation to have been is there was an individual who had uh, robbed or attempted to rob one of the banks, and then uh, as they chased him, it it, it winded up playing out uh, behind the high school, and uh, and 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 the department spent its uh, as we were. It's an active shooter live situation. So we've reached out for additional resources for the state to come help, for other local agencies to come help to make sure that it doesn't spill over into the high school. That was our biggest fear at the time. And um, the, the officers, we had hostage negotiators, we had other people trying to talk the situation down for over an hour and a half out there in the snow, out there in the cold, nobody wanted to do anything. So by, unfortunately, our profession is at times a violent one. And, and it's not, it's, it's scary to anyone who, who's involved in it. It's also scary to the officers. And that's one of the reasons we wanna make sure that we look at uh, uh, officer wellness and, and safety itself. But yeah, it, it, I, I think that you know, we do want to, to not dismiss anyone's experiences, but, I, but we want to make sure we continue that dialogue. And, and as far as the sanctity of life for the Montpelier Police Department and how we look at things, it's, uh, it's 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 a complex it's a complex situation. Complex job. I just looked up SRO and Googled it, but I couldn't find it. Standing room only, single <laughs> occupancy. Um, so, could you tell me what SRO means? Uh, SRO is a school resource officer. Oh, okay. So, and and uh, and as you're googling it, there's another. Um, you can look at like a national SR. If you type in national SRO, I think you'll come to a professional organization that talks about a national association of school resource officers. And okay. that will lay out the pillars. This is pretty much one of the golden standards of the SRO program. And our hopeful uh, SRO, uh, Diane Matthews, has already undergone that 40-hour training block. And that's something that a lot of other, a lot of um, police agencies don't don't send their people to. Um, and but we're able to do it. We try to make sure that our budgets, you know, we try to operate within our budgets to send because that's expensive. We're paying for people to go there to come back, um, their time, uh, all the logistics and everything to it, as well as overtime for officers to to fill the gap that Diane would leave as she's off for training. Um, but. but important to us and we more, we need to make sure there's never a good time to do it but we need to make sure we do it at all times but um so but what was the SRO's involvement in the shooting that Joan was talking about 
Uh, well, at that time, the detective Nisley was there and uh, he was in constant communication with the principal and the superintendent, letting them know uh, how things were playing out to put the school on lockdown. This is what we're this is what the basic the, the crux of the situation is. And this is how we're trying to contain it and move it forward. Um, and I, I would. Say, uh, oh, sure. I, I have to say, like the way the lockdown itself was handled seemed uh, clear and uh, and well organized. So, you know, it wasn't. I, I, I'm not bringing this up just to like complain or something, but I just uh, I'm bringing it more just because I'm really aware of how alienating that whole situation was for the youth there. And, um, so and it's I I don't I don't have a full picture of what happened even that day. You know I, I haven't researched it in depth, so I I don't have like that much clarity myself on the ins and outs of it. But I still think it just affects affected all those students, regardless of what the rights and wrongs of it. I, I, I totally hear you. Um, but unfortunately, in that situation, it wasn't the department that chose where that ultimately happened. It was the individual that made the decision to go to the bank and then made the decision to, to stay there. And, and um, while we would try to minimize exposure and risk to other people, uh, in, in that situation, it, it was something that we 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 couldn't dictate. That situation, it was it's entirely dictated by the person who who, who caused it, and and it's unfortunate. Well, one chilling aspect about it is that the person was shot fourteen times. I think that scares people. One of one of the things about uh, a lot of studies on this um, and experiences with it is typically in those situations, there's a, there's a, a tunnel vision effect and, 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 and heightened heighten awareness, heightened adrenaline, everything to that effect. It's, it's hard to, to tune in or to hear everything else that's going on. Normally when after I wasn't there, so I, I don't know for sure, I haven't seen the, action, action, the after action report. I do know that state police investigated and, um, and cleared the incident, which is, you know, I don't want to make that sound bad or dismissive, but, they looked at all different avenues of it. And, uh, but in those situations, when I've been in those situations myself in Chicago, when, when, when there's somebody who's pointing a gun at me um, and I hear a shot, I don't know, my first gut instinct is, I don't know if I'm being shot at. So most, so it, it's, there are a lot of studies on out, out there that say that most officers will engage in those types of situations. So it is unfortunate that that happened, but I, I think that's one of the perils um, of, of what happens that when, when we're all human and we come into a situation, they didn't know, um, the only thing that we could deal with at that point in time was what we understood the threat to be at that particular point in time and, and, and move forward from there. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, it, it doesn't sound like much of an answer, but the, the other thing that I would, would also mention that at, I had previously uh, spoken about, I'm sorry, there's somebody who's looking at the meeting that it was, was something that uh, um, was having like a, in other departments, uh, other locations, um, departments have uh, what's called a citizen's academy, if you will. And in this academy, um, uh, the department will show folks who want to come to it um, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a long training about what policies and procedures are, what use of force models are, um, and everything that the department does uh, in its day-to-day -day routines. It, it ride along looking at you know, uh, role-playing scenarios, and we would also invite uh, members of the public you know, to, to, to do these things. And I, and I think it's beneficial because it will allow uh, people in the community who don't have a, a really close access to what it is that officers do on a day-to-day -day basis and what they could be faced with and what they do face. Um, so to see that it's not always as simple as, as a black and white issue, there's a lot of gray in what we do. And, um, and it also has the opportunity for us to get the same feedback that, hey, you guys are kind of in the forest among the trees, but as I'm doing this training, I see an opportunity here that we may want to look at. 
And it's incumbent upon that department to take that idea and see if we can implement it and run with it. Anything that, any ideas that anyone has that we can, can perform our jobs safely for ourselves and for the people of the city, we're all ears to hear. And that um, Citizens Academy, if you will, um, is something that I'm looking to hopefully try to implement uh, as soon as I possibly can. I have, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I've had this thought that's been in my heart for many years and I composed a letter to the police department years ago and then I was like, oh, it's, you know, <laughs> but I just want to put it out there to you. Um, so most of the time our police uh, officers are in their cars and I know we have the bicycle officers and that's, you know, people like that. I have long felt it would be great if each officer for one piece of, of shift a week could take a walk downtown. Um, you know, the pandemic isn't a great time for walking and getting coffee and stuff, but, you know, for, for officers to actually on foot sort of um, in a relaxed manner, get to know, um, you know, what's happening uh, on the street, who, who has that shop and who are those people that often hang out on that corner? Um, you know, just a small thing, but I think in a way it can be a big thing. I definitely understand. And uh, that's something that, that I've been hearing over and over and not just from members of the community, but from, from the officers within our own department. A lot of them take a lot of extra steps to get out there and talk to members of the community, talk to families, um, talk to business owners, um, but uh, minimum staffing keeps them from being able to come out as much as possible. So it's incumbent upon us, myself and my team, my supervision team, to find out different ways that we can try to be flexible so, so we can uh, get out there um, and, and allow our officers to get out there to interact with people in the community on a positive basis. The thing that we hate the most is that, that no officers, the only time that you see me um, is when something bad happens that, you know, shame on me. Um, that, that should not be the case. We should take every opportunity, every step that we can to, to be out there in, in, in the community and the public. And, and um, we will make sure that we, we continue to do that and that we expound upon that. I'm sorry, Richard, you're, um, you're still uh, muted. I, I prepped you for that question from Pat. <laughs> yeah, she, she, she made sure I knew. She's one of several that made sure I knew. <laughs> well, I happened to attend a city council meeting when a member of the public said, I've been suggesting for years that police walk around town and nothing has happened. So. I'll, sir, I'll echo that request. I am going to put three stars. <laughs> Good. And that, Good. that's like, again, the fifth page of feedback from just from the officers as well as from, 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 uh, from everyone else. So we, we will make sure we have that. But there is something I also wanted to bring up. Um, th there's also, we've also experienced the opposite. And uh, just being fair that um, in some neighborhoods as officers are walking around or it's, they don't get that. And, and I'm not trying to say woe was us and everything to that effect, but there are some people that don't want us around. There are some people who are saying, why are you in my neighborhood? I prefer you not be in my neighborhood. I prefer you go someplace else. So there, there's always, um, uh, there's always some people who disagree with, with officers being around and, and, you know, but we want to do what we can to push past that and try to break that barrier and then just try to try to um, try to get out and continue relating to the people that we serve, and and I also have to to uh, to uh, clarify something else when we were when, I, when we were talking about the embedded uh, mental health professional or the social worker, um, it's not just going to be between um, Montpelier and uh, Barry. Uh, I've been reminded just uh, hey actually what it is is access to all of Washington County. Washington County Mental Health Services. So, um, so this is uh, this is a person that's going to be doing the work throughout the throughout the county and using all the county resources, not just in in our two cities. So, something happens, and the police officers want to call a social worker. 
they contact Washington County and Washington County advises them or they send a social worker? Or how does that work? Uh, the current idea, the current philosophy is that the uh, the social worker will be embedded. So if not uh, primarily, again, in, in the areas of Montpelier and, and Barry, um, but again, accessible throughout the county. So it would be um, if, if, if something happened, there's a crisis situation, social workers would make sure and we would need to make sure that the situation is safe and the social for the social worker to come in and, and, and do that, do that. So it wouldn't be they would be riding around with us, if you will, or have an office within our, our respective uh, departments and able to respond at the same time the officers are able to respond. So they would be riding around with you? Uh, or have or definitely have access to do that. That's that's the current that's the current philosophy and what we're thinking. That is a, a is a best practice. In, in my previous department in Alamogordo, uh, we we took one of our unmarked cars and we handed it over to. Um, we were able to um, to dedicate an officer to be a mobile crisis response officer that specifically went on calls that we knew to be mental health related issues uh, in conjunction with that embedded um, social worker. So they actually responded with the officers as well. So I, I think it's probably, you know, we haven't worked out uh, the nuts and bolts about it yet, but, I, but from what I understand, it's going to be responding at the same time other um, police officers are responding to the situation and then coming in once the scene is, is rendered safe, that they're not in jeopardy of being hurt. And I, I have a, some thoughts about this as you're figuring out the nuts and bolts of how this is what this is going to look like. Um, I've had several lives and one of them is that I was part of the domestic violence movement very early on uh, in the 70s and 80s. Um, and in the early 90s. And the courts would want us as advocates to um, negotiate the terms when we went into court for restraint to extend the restraining order. The courts wanted advocates to negotiate the terms of, let's say, visitation and between the parties. And at the time, I don't know what the status is now, but at the time, the philosophy was that we did not want to do that because we didn't want to appear to be an arm of the court. And whatever, however you work this out, I hope that the social worker can separate themselves from law enforcement so that people aren't feeling or thinking, you know, that they're being heavily handed by you know, not only the police, but also social services or whatever. I mean, the last thing we want is for them to feel like no one is listening to them, you know, or, you know, whatever they're thinking or feeling. So I'm sure you might have, I'm sure you're probably thinking about this, but I just wanted to also put it out there that that has been my experience, past experience, that we need to be mindful of that when we hire people to come on and help or to provide, you know, um, rounded services. That, that, that is a very, very good point. And uh, because if, if there is gonna be that perception of officers, um, we wanna make sure that doesn't bleed over to somebody who, somebody who, is, um, who is there to, to make sure they, that the folks have access to the resources that are gonna help them. So that is extremely strong point. And that is something that I'm going to make sure I definitely take back to the rest of the team um, to make sure we incorporate and do that right. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, yes, I'm sorry. go ahead, please. Just, I don't know if I missed this at the beginning of the conversation. Just could you say a few words about how it is for your family settling into your new community? Um, it is, it has been a gem. As, as a matter of fact, my wife Natalie is, and my daughter Gabriella are, are sitting here in the office with me. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we have, um, we have absolutely fell in love. And uh, we, we really um, feel fortunate and blessed to be here and part of this community. Um, it, it, there's, there's a lot of things that uh, this city has done right. And it's in, a, um, 
I think it's in, a, in, a, in, in an unapologetic pursuit of doing everything is possible to um, to do right by everybody, and and um, w w it's it, it's intoxicating. We absolutely love it. I'm sorry. Sorry, uh, Joan, if I may, may I, may I call you Joan? Yes, go for it. Yes. Um, I, I just wanted to make sure, I mean, I, I, I didn't want to come off crass or, uh, or anything else. I, I, I wanted to know if, if, if I hit any of the things or answered any of the things you may have feeling or, or maybe if I said something that, that kind of like, you know, upset, upset you or something that you didn't, didn't disagree with, I want to make sure that, um, that we can continue that that type of dialogue because that is scary. That, that that's an absolutely scary situation. So I want to make sure I, I don't come across as impartial or discounting of it. Well, yeah, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. I think I'm not actually looking for any specific response right in this moment. I think it's more. I just wanted to uh, share this experience that I've somewhat participated in. It's not my own personal experience, but it's something that I've seen happen and just um, ask you to consider as you're getting to know Montpelier, like um, that, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who are never gonna show up for a, a gathering like this. And like, how do you, right, you know, how do we as a, a community build relationships around these situations? Um, that, that happened, you know, and they're, they're very real. And uh, so, and I, and, uh, you know, I mean, this is unfolding all across the entire country too. And many communities are dealing with this in much worse ways than Montpelier. Um, but I feel like we have our own version of it here. And I just wanted to like, more just ask that you think about it and, and think about getting to know our young people in some way or another. I, I, Brian, do you mind if I interject? Yes, please. I just, I think another um, uh, work that the city is doing right now that I think would be of interest to a lot of people in these kind of conversations is we do have a social and economic justice committee who's been very active. Um, they just approved um, to reach out to a, a vendor who's going to help us with that outreach. Um, so they're looking for an equity um, a specialist who can help us, um, I think, get to Joan's point. Um, a lot of people don't want to be participatory in government conversations and are not going to show up um, to government hosted anything. And, and those are some of the people that are most important for us as a city to communicate with. And we know that and we know as part of the system, it's almost impossible for us to, to navigate those spaces. So we're, we're really excited about bringing on this consultant who can help us um, sort of reach the people that we know we can't reach on our own. Um, and I think that'll have a lot to bearing in Brian's position because I think, you know, those people will have opinions on the police that we haven't been able to hear. And that's, again, I think we, we sort of mentioned that this time of listening. So we're just really excited. And thank you for, for mentioning that because I think you're right. A lot of people don't want to show up to these things and how how do we make sure that their voices are heard as well so thank you and, and if I can piggyback off to what Cameron said the other thing is um I, I want to make sure that um wh while I have my opinions I consider myself a very flexible person and only time will tell um and, and I hope to earn that trust but uh, I want to make sure that 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 people who you know somebody may say I'm not going to come or I'm not going to sign on to that because he or she is not going to listen to what I have to say anyway, and they're not going to value that. And that's the exact opposite of, um, is, of what I want to accomplish. And, and, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of us have had past experiences in, in dealing with um, I, I, people who are in positions of power, quote unquote, um, that, have an that, that, have that, that have an obligation to listen to the people that they serve and they don't do it. And, and I am not one of those people. I'm one of those people who comes in and says, I know what it feels like. I know what I remember what it feels like um, in certain places and certain times I still experience it. And, and I'll be damned if I allow somebody else to have that same feeling. So I, I think it is incumbent upon me to listen to what everybody has to say um, in areas that we do disagree. We talk about it because the only way any of us learns 
is to uh, to listen to what somebody else says honestly and absorb it and then then take it to heart and look at where we as individuals, where I as an individual, what I have to play in it in the whole part. Um, apropos of distrust of the police, I would suggest, and I think that tenor of this conversation says the same thing. It's not only young people who were part of that high school incident, but I think there is almost widespread distrust of the police, but I'm generalizing, I don't know. In any case, one contributing factor was the incident that happened on the roundabout that I'm sure you know about and have reviewed. It seemed to most people to be a clear mental health question and the person was shot dead. So would you mind talking to us about that? Uh, sure, I, I um, in, in, in my experiences, um, you never know what that situation becomes. I'm, I'm drawn back to, uh, to an incident that happened in Chicago where there was an officer who um, was called to, to deal with a disturbance on one of the buses. And that officer and, and knew, as soon as he got there, they, they knew by, based on the description of the person who was causing the disturbance, they knew who it was. And this is somebody that they have dealt with time and time and time. And, and that, that's a word that, that also kind of, it's like, you know, was it necessary? Because how is it, if we're always responding to this calls, how is it that this person's never gotten that full amount of treatment? How are they still slipping through the cracks? Why are we still answering these calls of service all the time? Um, so that identifies another weakness within, within the system, the first responder system. But this officer had known this woman um, for a long time. And he came- It was a man, wasn't it? I'm sorry? It was a man. Oh, I'm sorry, you're talking yeah, about- it, it, Yeah, it, it was a woman that, 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 that someone had called the disturbance on. And no, it's okay. She, she was in a mental health crisis and the officer, he was a man, he came on, he tried to deescalate the situation. And just when he thought he did, and he's like, come well, come on and let's, let's go ahead and come off the bus. She actually took the revolver out of his holster and shot him in the back of the head. And this was somebody that he had known and dealt with for a long, long time and actually developed a, a, like a kind of a trustful relationship. And it's unfortunate because she was in crisis. And, um, and that's where, why in, in the city of Chicago, they went from having just a flat um, holster to an actual, what's called a, a, a double retention or a triple retention holster. Um, but those situations also play out. So when, when we do respond to, um, to dangerous situations, we're not sure what we're getting. And we're trying to assess in, in, a, in a moment's notice. Uh, in the dark, in this situation, in the dark, not knowing what else is going on, only two officers available, no other backup, no one to to keep traffic from crossing in between, uh, being cognizant of what's behind that person. And if that person, if that is a real weapon, what's behind me if they shoot? Who are they going to shoot? Who are they going to hit? So there are a lot of there are a lot of things to look at. And it's a scary situation. I know for a fact those two officers. Um, <coughs> It was a very, very tense situation. It's something that they're dealing with still now. It's something their families are dealing with now. And, um, and I'm not trying to minimize, um, I believe was, I'm not trying to minimize what happened, but I'm trying to say that in situations like that, it's something that's incumbent upon me to try to avoid because no one wins in that situation. Everyone's hurt. The community, the person who shot, the officers who have to do the shooting. So it's my responsibility to do everything I can to give them the tools they need to hopefully preserve life um, in, in those situations. So um, I, I don't want it to be, you know, it, I, I can kind of transition over to tasers. I don't want it to be that the only thing that officers have to deescalate a situation is a gun, um, OC chemical spray, and a hunk of steel, which is the ASP, which is that, um, the baton. Those are the only things that officers right now in the Montpelier Police Department have to deescalate a situation. That's it. Other than that, a hands-on fight. So you know, we it's it's incumbent upon us to try to figure out what tools are out there, what are the best tools to use, and how do we use those tools responsibly. Um, so it's a, uh, it keeps me up a lot trying to trying to figure this out. And um, I, I think that's uh, so. I, yeah, I am very sorry that that had to happen. I'm sorry for everyone who had to be involved in that.
may, may I ask a question of, of you so I can get some knowledge? And I don't want to, please don't take it as in, de, in a defensive way, but I'm trying to figure something out. Um, the, the, when, when I researched Montpelier, um, when I was applying for the job and, and when I was researching it back in this, in, in, while I was in Chicago um, several years ago, everyone seemed to be very positive and supportive of the community and less uh, of the department itself and less suspicious. And, and I understand the two um, shootings that have happened. There were officer involved shootings, but um, I'm trying to figure out that, that there seems to be a lot of, um, there's a lot of distrust right now. It, it feels like a lot of distrust, you know, that my officers are, are, are in my one-on-one -on -one interviews are saying to me over and over, I feel like I've done everything I possibly could to, to work with people and to be happy with people. And now all of a sudden it feels like everybody hates me. And, and I'm trying to figure out how, um, if you can, can help me to understand um, how, this, how this dynamic unfolded. Um, cause a lot of, a lot of officers are saying I wasn't there. I wasn't the one that, that was in Minneapolis, but I'm, I'm being hit with that brush and, and the community seemed very supportive of the department, but now it seems that it's, it's rightfully so very critical to me. I look at it as it's, it's something that happened and said, Hey, if that happened over here, what it's time for me to look at my focus and make sure that my department doesn't do that. But th I'm still trying to, trying to get my hands around it. And, um, I'm I'm looking for some some insight and some um some ad, some advice and some guidance here if you all wouldn't mind uh, sharing with me. Well, I don't mean to just sound like a sore head, and this is a minor point. But this morning in your conversation, when you were talking about how polite the police department is, mm -hmm. I was. This is trivial, but um, there were all the, I was on the corner of state and Maine and there were all these chickens running around loose. And so there was a cruiser stopped. There were no, there was no traffic. The cruiser was stopped at the light and I approached the officer and I spoke through his window, you know, and I said, what have, have you caught the chickens? And he said, I'm not going to give you a ticket for jaywalking. So that was really rude. And, you know, it wasn't, uh, it's a minor point, but they're not always polite. And, you know, um, and I've had, I mean, you know, I'm not a renegade. Um, the, I've had, I have, you know, Tangentially, I've had experiences with the police where they have come and performed social service functions. And I think that's a waste. I mean, I think redistribution needs to occur because, you know, the police shouldn't necessarily have to spend their time um, redirecting patients or, you know, people who are living at home who've taken the wrong medication and so forth. But, you know, I just... I thought of that incident this morning when you were saying this is Montpelier polite department. Not always. No, not always. Yeah, but that that is I think that was um, um, is, is like within the culture of within a very macho culture. Um, we're almost in some cases that it sounds like it kind of like looked at as a as a uh, is, is a different organism all entirely because um, that that we expect our officers to to do their best to 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 treat everybody, no matter what they're feeling or, or dealing with at that time, um, with respect, no matter what you know what uh, what calls. And I don't want to make excuses uh, for that, and that that shouldn't have happened. And I'm sorry that happened. Um, but we're trying to figure out ways to help officers. You know, like one of the six pillars that I mentioned before was um, officer wellness and safety. So if an officer went to uh, a domestic situation in which that maybe a child was hurt um, and they're angry about that, how, how do we give them the tools to step back? Because we can't say, OK, you can get to go take an hour break to try to get yourself together. It's like, no, we the call is over with. We need you back on the clock to answer the next call. 
So how can we figure out different ways to, to help them process through what they're feeling and experiencing without taking it off on, uh, uh, taking all out on the person that they're next going to come in, in contact with. So, so that's one of the challenges that we're trying to get, uh, get through. And that's, again, that's incumbent upon me to, to try to figure out what resources I can give to those officers. But I apologize if that situation happened. It was very rude, but I feel compelled to note that I was involved in another chicken incident with a neighbor where the, chi the chickens kept escaping and I kept trying to apprehend them. And I didn't call the police. But, oh, he happened along um, the street. And I said, you know, I don't know who these, you know. So he helped. He got stuck helping, you know, capturing the chickens. And they kept, you know, we kept returning them to the coop. And then they kept escaping. So, you know, that's the converse. And he was very helpful there. And, you know, the poor thing, he was just driving by. And I drew him into this other chicken incident. Uh, to, to me, that's a battery recharge. I think it's, I think it's great. I'd, I'd have loved to have been out there. <laughs> there was, there was one time in, when I was in Alamogordo, my, 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 one of like my third day on the job, actually, no, it was my first day. Cause I had to go qualify. So I, I went to one area to qualify on something. And as I'm coming back, there's a, uh, there's a family of quails coming across the road. And uh, so we got out the car and we're trying to help the quails get through me and this, this older captain and, you know, and we're all in uniform and everything. And then by the time I got back to the station, I had several people coming up to me. Why are you blocking traffic and messing around with ducks? Why are you chasing ducks around? The street? <laughs> like, but I thought it was great. Um, there, there was something that, uh, that I did want to mention that you had, you have a very good point um, that police shouldn't have to spend their time redirecting community resources and, uh, and, and looking at those allocations of funding. It's um, that's something that a lot of uh, police chiefs have long been advocating that we shouldn't be doing. Unfortunately, there's a lot of interdependency. So if if in these calls, it's not just looking at the at the police department's funds or policies, it's also looking at the policies of other institutions. So if if one were to call um, uh, a social service agency and say, hey, I have this is going on, my family member's in crisis, I need help. Um, I'm not sure what resources they have, I'm not sure if, if they have policies in place that they can come out to respond. But one of the other things that they're probably going to say is that if it is a, if, if it is a potentially dangerous situation, they're going to, it's part of their policies to call us in to come try to deescalate the situation in the first place. So even if we try to avoid it, what are the policies of the other institutions that are out there? And um, I think that, that they need to be part of this dialogue. I'm not trying to brush the responsibility on them too, but it's like, they should be part of this dialogue. And I know Mary's up to the task. I know the, the, the county's up to the task, but we all together can figure out different ways and how we can respond to these types of crisis incidents. Because again, we're all intertwined in, in responding to first, uh, first aid and, and, and mental health crisis situations. I'd like to go back and um, to your question, Brian. And yes. uh, I don't have an answer, uh, but I certainly can speak to my experience and why I'm feeling the way I'm feeling now about law enforcement. Other than saying going through the 60s, it wasn't always a positive experience dealing with law enforcement, but that's that's... That's many years ago. That's enough. <laughs> no, it was. I heard my parents' horror stories when they were dealing with it. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'd like to bring it closer to where we are right now. And, you know, when people would say, uh, would talk about George Floyd and how he, he was killed, and I'd say, he wasn't killed. He was murdered. I mean, I really felt it was important. I, I, I don't, you know... I, I may be splitting hairs, but to me, we all witnessed a murder and it was real. It was no longer this surreal thing that you were watching on TV. And although, you know, you'd hear these stories uh, to actually witness a murder really heightened on top of everything else that's, you know, we're right. It's a perfect storm, right? With COVID and, and everything else. So between that and also the years of feeling like people have been expressing injustice for decades, and it seems like 
very little has been accomplished. And I'm at the point, you know, at first I'd get into the mode, well, nothing's going to change anyway. It never does. But now I'm angry about it. <laughs> and uh, so I think that that's maybe what you may be hearing. You certainly would be hearing that from me, that that's what I'm experiencing is my anger. And it's not necessarily at any one person. I think it's just at the system that has not been willing uh, to really look at itself and make the necessary changes. And I'm so glad to see young people, I kind of see myself in them now, to be able to get on board. And I keep, and I, now that I'm much older, I keep saying, don't let up until you get what you want. Just don't say, oh, they've heard us. My feeling is that's not enough. You keep pushing until you get what you want. Because I feel like whenever I step back and said, oh, they've heard us, we're gonna see this change, it didn't happen. And so at least for myself, that may be what you're hearing is, is that emotion more than anything else. Well, and to follow up on what Rachel's saying, it wasn't only George Floyd. Every day there's a new revelation and some atrocity that the police have either covered up or the criminal justice system has, you know, it, it's, um, it's compounded. And, you know, last weekend, um, I'm a lesbian, and last year in New York, I marched with the Queer Liberation March. This year, um, it became the Queer Liberation March in support of Black Lives Matter. So people of color um, led it, were all the speakers. And at the end of the time, apparently one marcher graffitied a police car and the police just pepper sprayed all the marchers. And I, it was caught on tape. I watched it. I cried. Um, and so it's certainly in the national ethos to be distrustful of the police. And I was angry like Rachel is. I was infuriated by that. Um, you know, here's the fifth. It was really the 50th anniversary of Stonewall because the march happened you know, the first march was a year later. And this is what happens. Four people were arrested. They were kept overnight in this COVID country. Um, so, and Montpelier is part of it. I mean, you know, it's not like we're this isolated Oz kind of um, island. Because I, you know, we're part of the United States, and it's, you know, um, racism is so endemic everywhere. I, Brian, I had a, a comment to you on your question, and I, I mean, I have to say, like, I don't actually have very much firsthand experience of interacting with the police in Montpelier. Um, you know, uh, as a white person who lives in a middle-class neighborhood, like I just, the police are rarely, rarely in my neighborhood and I, I don't have calls, I don't have reason to like call on them or anything. And so I don't, I don't have any, personally, I don't have bad experiences either. Um, you, but a few weeks ago, uh, the police actually came to my house, and I'm not going to describe the whole situation here. Um, I don't work in media because it's too complicated, and uh, and I don't want to share all the personal details about this either. But um, there was a young person who had done something really more as a statement of um, concern about police violence, and it ended up with the police coming to my house to talk to this person, and. Um, and it all got sorted out, you know, nothing really much happened. But I felt like the way that the police officer handled the situation um, 
like it was clear to all all of us involved that this this incident was really much more of a statement of what's going on on a national level than a specific um, you know incident uh, involving you know somebody else's property and um, and like this kind of there's all kinds of things happening on a national level with people like taking down statues and different things like that so there's a lot of like protest things happening. And I just felt like the officer who came by my house didn't really have much ability to like take a step back and see the big picture and um, and really like felt like he, he was trying to like lecture us on the uh, details of the situation and not and, and I mean obviously he needed to do his job and be like okay this is what you did it was wrong and this is the consequence and like I'm fine that he had to like lay that kind of thing out but I, I felt like he could have done a better job, like putting it in the context of the bigger picture, what's happening on a national level, and rather than just kind of going into lecture mode about the details of what had happened, um, that I I feel like just wasn't very helpful in that moment. So that's just a concrete example of like an officer in Montpelier doing something that was like it wasn't like bad or terribly wrong, but it just wasn't like in tune with the times in my mind. So I hope that's helpful. Okay. Okay. I, I think I, I think I have an understanding of, of what you're saying. Um, that it, it, it sounds to me like what I'm hearing that it's um the anger is being focused at at, at, at a representative of an at, at a, as a representative of an institution, that there's so much anger at the institution that there's going to be a focus of the dissatisfaction. Uh, it's uh, that 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 that's where it's coming from. Am I close or? I, I think that can be part of it. Uh, it's certainly what is what I was expressing. Okay. So, so then, then, then if I could, then, then I guess my next question is, how, how can, what can the Montpelier Police Department do to, to show, you know, our goal is to be a national example of, of mutual respect and dignity and sanctity of life. And we're going to stumble along the way, but what, what can we do to, to separate ourselves from an institution which rightfully so has been historically um, uh, oppressive to people of color, to people who are poor, um, to people who don't fit in that social norm. And, um, but what can we do? How can we get out there to try to earn the trust of people who are, who are angry and afraid of us? And I'm trying to, uh, I've had to deal with that um, myself from coming from a very personal level and I'm trying to I, I need uh, I would would love for some guidance and some help um, of what what our department can do to make sure we uh, so that that you know how, how do we become is it I guess, I guess there's no way there's, there's no simple answer or way to even ask the question but um, I, I think I'm very grateful that I'm that I'm here with you now to, to try to figure it out but um, how do we how do we how do we do it are there, I've, have you read a, or seen or heard of the book called my grandmother's hands uh, i'm sorry have what you, was it called the book called i'm my reading book. it now yeah <laughs> we okay. were just talking about it okay it's called my grandmother's hands and it's a book about racialized trauma mm -hmm. and the author of it he he works with police departments on this issue. And okay. I think his work is really, really interesting. And I would love to see our police department take it up in some way or another. I, I'll definitely take a look at it. I don't know what it is. I, I know my life experiences in dealing with police departments and dealing with racism. Um, and they're, they're significant, but I don't know the, um, I know the lessons I've learned and how I want to try to push on and how I want to try to spread that message through, through what it is I do and through the department that I'm a part of. 
but what, what are some of the takeaways from the book? That so he ta the author talks about how a lot of the violence that we see against people of color in this country comes out of this like long history of trauma and that the way, you know, he just talks about like the, that we live in a culture that like, that treats the white body as the like, the standard by which everything else is judged and that um, we look on black bodies as somehow uh, more disposable and that this like affects our whole culture and the way the policing is in our culture. And that until we address some of this underlying trauma in ourselves and in our police departments that we're not going to ever really uh, get past the situation that we're in. So, he, you know, he says, you know, it's helpful to change policies and helpful to change procedures and do training, but this underlying trauma really affects uh, everything that happens. And, and he just lays it out really clearly and he's a trauma specialist. And, um, so it's really, I think it's really interesting his approach and, um, and, and this is like a different way of thinking about it. It might supplement other things that are happening. So, so if we look at, if we, if we take a hard look at the police department, is that gonna solve everything? What else do we need to look at and what other changes do we need to make and how can the Montpelier Police Department be part of that change? Yeah. I think it's time for us to examine all of our institutions and how we function. And how each institution supports the oppression of people. And you know my view already about school resource officers. I shared that this morning. Go ahead, Cameron. I was just gonna, uh, first I wanna acknowledge um, and thank everyone for sharing these. I think um, this time um, of the sharing can be very hard sometimes and I just wanna thank everyone for being very honest with us because there's no growth without honesty. And I just really appreciate that from all of you. Um, I was just also going to say, you know, um, I'm not trying to rest my hat on this one solution, but um, we're very excited to work with um, an equity consultant because we're, we want that for our whole organization. Organizationally, we want to see what we're doing unintentionally that that worsens our, our relationship or we you know call out what we're doing well and and try to spread that throughout our, our organization so um you know this is ongoing work that we've you know can't let go of and we appreciate having residents that are you know telling us what they want and what they changes they want to see so thank you I think it's also, oops i'm sorry go ahead pat um so I, I don't have an answer to your question, Brian, about, you know, <clears throat> maybe feelings that aren't totally positive about our police department. I think, you know, I agree that it's sort of a global, you know, that global <clears throat> residual um, distrust. But I guess I would like to counter um, and say there was, there was a, there were some young people who, um, organized a demonstration before COVID. Um, they took over the, uh, the intersection of state and Maine, some very young people. It was about climate action. And I was very impressed with the Montpelier De Police Department for sort of allowing it, even though it stopped traffic, they didn't have a permit. Um, you know, and I felt that in that instance, the police did well allowing them to have their free speech, but also encouraging them to, you know, <clears throat> be respectful. And I also attended the, the lar very large Black Lives Matter rally a few weeks ago. And I was again, impressed with the Montpelier Police Department for being present, but, you know, <clears throat> allowing it to be peaceful and, um, you know, a major expression of people's uh, hurt. So. Thank you. Thank you. And Rachel, you were, you were going to say something. I was just going to say that I think it's, you know, uh, as individuals, I, 
I worry that sometimes we get reductive in our way of thinking that we want something simple. We want something quick. And the reality is, is I think that it's going to take all time, which we all know. I'm not saying anything none of us already know. It's going to take a while. I mean, you know, it's like anything, as you were saying earlier, you know, we all need to earn everyone's trust, you know, and, um, and actions are the best way to either um, gives us a passageway for that to happen or, um, you know, or, or it can also make us more distressful. So um, I'd like to be hopeful. <laughs> And I think your timing to come to Montpelier is, is a good one. At first, I thought, oh, my God, what a horrible time to start a new position. But I also think it's a very good time to start a, a new position. Thank you. And, um, you know, from, um, from a very personal standpoint, I'd like to thank you all. Um, first and foremost, for having this dialogue, for your honesty. And um, for actually demanding um, that uh, our government do what we're supposed to do and treat treat people with respect, because um, because of the things that you guys are doing now, my daughter's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Her chances are going to be okay, and so I'm grateful for that. Um, and um, as a, as a, as a, as, as as, a, as an officer with the Montpelier Police Department. I appreciate the candid feedback. Um, I appreciate the ideas. And, and I appreciate the fact that you're willing to continue to hold us accountable to what it is that we need to be doing out there. And um, um, and I honestly, seriously, sincerely mean that. So, so, so thank you very much. I really appreciate the time and, and, and everything in our, in our discussion. I'm really grateful for it. Thank you. Thank you. So, but unless there's anything else, um, I think we've hit the 732 mark and um, uh, we'll work on trying to clear out those bugs uh, that are that are on the, uh, the front porch forum. And hopefully when folks click on that link that it'll come uh, right in without having to work on a password. So again, thank you all so much and, and enjoy your, your 4th of July weekend. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye.